Are you a business owner looking for real advice and input? You're in the right place. From concept to launch to growth, funding and beyond. Welcome to Startup Hustle with your hosts. One once sold a business for $150 million. The other, the author of Million Dollar Bedroom. Here are your hosts of Startup Hustle, Matt DeCourcy and Matt Watson. And we're back. Another episode of Startup Hustle. Matt DeCourcy here with Matt Watson. Hi, Matt. What's going on? I'm here in the studio doing this thing again. Just living the dream another day. Or living in the studio doing podcasts. Knocked a few of them out this week. Spreading some knowledge. Yeah. You know, one thing that everybody needs is a little bit of knowledge, and it always starts with learning. That's right. It does. Yeah. So that's why we brought our guest in today that's right he's gonna 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 learn us we're gonna get learned i'm hoping to learn something uh, you probably will but i i'll try so <laughs> anyway we've got clarence tan clarence the co-founder and ceo of bottle learning and that's b-o-d-d-l-e yes hi clarence how's it going guys doing good man thanks for coming by no worries looking forward to uh talking about your recent victories and your platform. I, I've checked it out. It's cool. Thank you. It's thank cool. You. And I'm sure I will learn more about it. So let's get right into that. So tell us about Bottle. Yeah. So Bottle, um, it's an education app that helps uh, K through eight teachers deliver engaging uh, practice and assessments through gameplay. So the idea is that we get kids to enjoy essentially doing homework and taking tests. And then we're able to grab that data and to turn it into reports for teachers so they don't have to grade homework anymore. Wow. Well, the teachers are going to love this. Yep. So they get kids to enjoy doing homework. We always say good software starts with a problem that yeah. needs to be solved. So how is that going? Is that, I mean, clearly it's doing well, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah. how do you get kids to enjoy doing homework? Do you turn it into a game? Yes. Yeah, so what we do is uh, we build this like whole game environment and then we take like industry standard homework uh, um, items which is you know multiple choice true false short answer questions and then we just make it look fun and pretty so students won't even know that oh this is this is a game and then they're actually doing homework and then what we have found that is when they um, interact with the homework questions through a game they're actually more obviously more engaged but then they actually interact with more of the homework questions so we're actually getting a lot more data uh, to teachers than you know a worksheet or some normal like um, homework platform. So, really so when you say it's a game, okay, I'm doing my uh, let's say it's multiple choice, right? Yeah. So how is it different? Is it still just a multiple choice question, or are we, or are we talking about like they're running around with a gun in a 3D game and they're shooting at the letter A? Like what, I mean, what <laughs> help us it, understand? Well, it's funny you mention that though, because when I was a kid, and I'm older than both of you, I'm 43, but I grew up playing a game. I remember playing Math Blaster. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it was like, yeah. did you play that growing yeah, up? I remember, All yeah. right. So, but you know what? I'm I'm okay at math, but that had a lot to do with it. But I loved playing it because it was like space invaders but i was doing math so yeah. i mean yeah. so how, it, how would you describe this yeah. yeah it's uh so what we do is very similar to what you talk about we make it fun for the user to actually interact with the question so it is still a multiple choice or short answer true false question uh, but then uh, we put it we put like a whole game environment in the back and uh so, for example, let's use Angry Birds, for example. You can really quickly gamify Angry Birds by saying, hey, instead of shooting the pig and trying to destroy it, let's put a couple pigs there, and you're going to destroy the right pig that corresponds to the correct answer. So now, using by inserting the multiple-choice question, you actually make the game more fun, and you also make so the can shoot, fun. So they could shoot the bird at the a pig or whatever yeah. you know, mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So we built a couple of these mini-games that incorporate these uh, bottle-headed characters, which is why we call our company uh, Bottle. Okay. Yeah, so these characters, the idea is that in the game, when they learn, their heads fill up. So they fill up the bottle. All right. Ah. And then when their heads are all full, they pour back out to water the environment and like make the world a better place. Sounds almost like you. Like, the more you feel you know, <laughs> the more, the bigger your head gets and before it explodes. But it doesn't explode. Says you. So, <laughs> well... Clearly, you're doing something right because what was that last week? Yes, that, last week. So mm-hmm. last week, uh, I'm just sitting there, and I believe I was looking at Startland News. Adam was here yesterday, and uh, here I see Clarence, and I've seen you around. But you were at our live podcast. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you. 
he was one of the 103,000 people that yeah, showed up I know. for that. That's how, why I don't remember him because there were so many people. How we're yeah. we going to announce that? Well, 103,000 uh, mm-hmm. forward slash 1,000? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, wait, uh, yeah, that's yeah, a good number. Right. You can do the math on that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I've seen you around. Uh, you've, you're uh, actively involved in our startup community, yeah. and mm-hmm. thanks for continuing to put us on the map. So let's talk a little bit. I'll let you tell our listeners what you won. All right, so I got accepted into the AT&T Aspire Accelerator. So they are an educational um, accelerator program. It's not based anywhere, so you don't have to fly to like San Fran or Austin. Um, so they they uh, invest $100,000 into your company, and they also give you a $25,000 grant for travel. So for example, last week we were in um, San Francisco um, when, when it kicked off. And then we'll be going to Philadelphia next, and then New York, and then some other places. That's awesome. So when they, so they're they're putting you on tour. Yes. And what do you do when at those stops? Are you just talking about about bottle? Um, for the most part, yes. So um, most of it is going to be learning. Uh, so for example, when we kicked off, they had a bunch of mentors who were industry experts that kind of ran through, hey, where are you in your company right now? Mm-hmm. Um, what do you need help with? And then they try to match you with everyone that they can find. And the great thing about AT&T is they pretty much have their fingers everywhere. Um, so I just found out recently that they owned HBO, which I had AT&T no idea. AT&T owns HBO? <laughs> yeah. So Weird. Like, when we kicked off, I was like, wow, there's Game of Thrones stuff everywhere. It was kind of crazy. Wow. You need to pay my AT&T bill. I won't, don't want my HBO to get shut off. It's the so, thing about this world. There's like four or five people that own everything. That we're, Jill and I were talking about that after I took my daughter to see JoJo Siwa, and we were like having a debate, and she was like, I think she's a Nickelodeon kid. I was like, yeah, but Disney probably owns them anyway. I don't know if they do or not. Yeah, it's like a 50-50 shot. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so is that was that the process? So how did you even get in front of AT&T Aspire? And, and, and what's your advice for someone that wants to enter something like that? Were you the only winner or were there several? No, there was, um, there was five other for-profit companies okay. and there were three um, non-profit companies. Are you a not-for-profit? Yeah, we're a for-profit company. Oh, you are. Okay, yeah. good. That makes me feel better. <laughs> Is that fair? Ah, it's okay. I think capitalism yeah. drives innovation, what yeah. can I say? Um, all right, so okay, so there was a, uh, there were multiple winners, but I have a feeling there was a hell of a lot more entries. Yes. Um, did, did they disclose that to you? I don't remember. I think it was upwards of two hundred. Oh, I bet it was more than that. Probably. Uh, yeah. So did you just have is like one of those things where you have to go to their website and just submit and. You go to the website. Pray, or was there, like, did you have to go yeah. somewhere and do a whole big pitch, or was that later, or how did that process So work? there was actually no pitching, but then um, when they would actually invite everybody who proceeded past a certain stage to Austin to kind of meet the team, and then, yeah, surprisingly, every single person that made it showed up, so it was it was good that um, that I showed up. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> it was one of those, hey, should I should I go, or should I not? And S- then, some of those things have really, de- uh, like, a lot of people. We had Joel Tepley in here from Cambrian, and they were in that thing in Atlanta, and they were one of the last couple of finals, but 6,000 people wow, had entered geez. that. Oh, wow. And that's a lot of competition. That's so, insane. But, I mean. yours, but this particular one, you were segmented in education. Yes, so okay. the AT&T program is just for education, so they kind of, like, They've been in education for so long, so they kind of like know how to run the show. So, for example, next or two weeks from now, I'll be going to Philadelphia. So this one is not so much of a learning or a programming. It's more so, hey, there's this big um, educational conference called ISTE. We got a spot for you. Um, yeah, show up and present your company. So they do a lot of that kind of stuff af- as well. So, um, and we don't have to get into the particulars, but was so was this an award or is AT and T your partner now? They. They're an investor. Okay, sure. Yep. Yeah. Which I think it's so my that's your you're my partner, right? <laughs> I don't know. Am I an investor? I think so. I didn't invest anything in the podcast. And I don't get paid for this, so <laughs> you keep bringing that up, man. <laughs> I mean, my god. I I do invest a lot of time, so you, I guess I am you, an investor. You get paid to come to work at well, we have a parent company much yeah. like I, AT&T does not own Full Scale, but Full Scale owns this podcast. All right. Yeah. Which might be owned by Disney. I'm not <sighs> sure yet. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm hoping to get, if we get owned by Disney, then you can get paid. Okay, cool. Yeah. So um, maybe Clarence can help us with that. So I don't think we've covered this yet. How did how did you get started in all this? Yeah. Oh man, it's crazy. So man, it's been eight years. Oh really? Wow. So I'm actually 30 this year. I know I don't look it. You don't uh, look a day over like. 18. Yeah, like last year. And I'm asked, jealous, by the way. I was asked to prom by a waitress. I'm like, oh, no way. Really? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no way. You don't want that. <laughs> Go for it. That's pretty awesome. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Did so, you, but did you go? No. Okay. Of course not. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's it started in 2011. Um, I was a junior at UMKC. Um, I've always spent my free time playing video games. And um, back then, I thought I wanted to be a stockbroker. I watched the, um, you know that movie with Will Smith? Um, Pursuit of Happiness. Yes. So yes. He, he made being a stockbroker sound so, like, happy. You know that scene where, like, oh, they look so happy. So that was kind of like I bought into that. So I jumped into the finance program, wanted to be a stockbroker. And then, hello. As we take selfies. <laughs> yeah. By the way, you can check us out at, at Startup Hustle Podcast on Instagram to see the very first ever selfie stick and studio shot. It's up. It's All up. right. It's there. And you should smile, man. Yeah, you know one thing I don't like about the selfie stick and the reason I'm wearing a hat is because it just really gets a great angle of the bald spot. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> yeah. So if the, if the future selfie stick ones look like they're coming from a low angle. Sorry, go ahead. So instead of being a stockbroker. <laughs> yeah, so I went through the finance program um, last year. Um, in, in, in school, I was like, you know what? I really don't like finance at all. I, I hate all of these classes, not because they were bad. It was just, I wasn't interested. Um, so I kind of decided, Hey, let's, uh, me and a couple friends, we started a game development studio on the side. It was based in South America, Colombia. And, um, so we did that on the side during my free time. So I graduated. I went to, um, I went to work for, uh, a mutual fund to do accounting and it was it was a really I, I didn't enjoy it I didn't enjoy it and then yeah we just started building our own games launched it we put in like seventy thousand dollars of our own money we, we made about eleven hundred <laughs> so you do the math we so lost. as an accountant you then hang on let me do the math on that yeah that's not good yeah it, it was bad um, so we would, we were gonna shut uh, close up shop and then we decided, hey, let's uh, start building games for other people. And then this is where, you know, all the clients were either universities, um, government, municipalities in South America, all, all to do with education. So we're like, there's, there's got to be something here. So we t took a look at the uh, education market, and they're like, so this was back in 2012 already. And we're like, man, there's really nothing good in the education space. You know, there are people like who are building, you know, $500 apps and selling them for eleven dollars a pop, making seven hundred thousand a year, at least they've claimed, saying, "Oh, parents will pay anything for their kids." So for us, we're like, "No, there's no way that the the games are at that quality." Did you repurpose any of your old technology, like your old any of the old game, the original game platform? Did any of that carry over? Or did nah. it apply? Mm -hmm. What was that first game? I mean, what what was that? What 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 was the objective of it? Oh man, we built. I've designed over like 85 games already, so wow. <laughs> a, a lot, and, and most of them were used uh, by the Colombian government right now. Um, so initially, we the were... The Colombian government yeah. using games? For their schools, yes. Okay, okay, okay. No, yeah, my, my, my dad thought when I told him that I was going to Colombia that I was selling drugs. <laughs> Either, if I told my dad I was going to Colombia, he'd cry because he'd think I actually got into an Ivy League school. Isn't Columbia in the Ivy League? Shows you how smart I am. I don't know. I think it is. I was thinking of Columbia, Missouri, which is yet another thing. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I, I this is a first, though. Clarence is definitely the first Colombian game designer yeah. here on the Startup Hustle. Congratulations. Sure. Oh, thank Congratulations. You, thank you. We'll, we'll add you to the, <laughs> the Hall of Fame, the Hustle Hall of Fame, which is coming soon. So, okay. So, that, so wow, 85 games. That's a lot. Yeah. Did, I mean, did any of them gain any traction? Um, so and hopefully you didn't spend $70,000 building each one of them. No. Okay. Yeah, but we, we got quite a bit of money from the government. I don't know how much I'm able to disclose, but I'm not part of the company anymore, so mm. um, I'll, I'll take my liberty with it. Uh, 
But essentially, what we did back then was it was very similar to how most educational games were built. Like, here is a game topic, or here's a, a learning topic, let's build a game around it. So we built one for fractions, one for addition, one for, you know, um, punctuation, and we, we, we were signed on to do first to 11th grade, all four subjects in math, um, Spanish, social studies, and science. I was going to say, you're probably doing all this content in Spanish, right? Yes. And so back then, it was one game per topic. Yeah. There was, when we counted, it was close to 700 topics. We, there was no way we could have done it. Uh, but we decided to go ahead and do it anyways. But then, you know, halfway through, we realized that, you know, it, did, it really didn't work in the classrooms. Educational games, the normal way doesn't. Because, first of all, the kids, they smell through the education right off the bat, right? Gonna say, oh look, here's a uh, you're, you're pouring water from one basin uh, to another. Learning. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then a teacher did not enjoy it too because they had to learn how the game worked. Sometimes, you know, as a game designer, we are not educators. We're like, oh, maybe this is how we can teach addition. Did not match the way that they actually taught. And then, so they had to learn it. If they if they agreed with the way we taught, now they had to do a pre-test and post-test to validate whether or not the game worked. So in order to make it, quote-unquote, a little bit more fun for the student, we're creating a lot more work for teachers. So that was kind of like where the whole idea of what if we can take industry standard practice and assessments and deliver it to students. Um, so that's kind of like where the idea first came out. You talk about like what the difference between something that feels really straightforward. It's probably like 65 episodes ago, Matt. We were talking about, you were talking about new math. Yeah. I saw it. Like my niece was doing it. I was like, you're drawing a tree. What are you doing? Like, yeah. And like, I get it. So, I mean, was that some of the issue that you were running into? Like, I don't, the new math, uh, why? Why do we need to reinvent math? That's a whole other topic. I get it. But yeah, so, and, and I would imagine that part of the problem too is, well, at some point they had to decide we're going to use new math. And then there was probably a lot of people that were like me and they're like, what's wrong with the current math? So do you, is that part of the problem with dealing with schools and getting, just getting people to agree that something should be adopted? Um, part of it, uh, I would say a lot of it is our own fault because we didn't know um, how to teach math. Sure. We were like, hey, let's watch a YouTube video. Oh, all right, this is how they teach addition. And we'd never validated whether or not that's how they did it in their country. Sure. So we designed a game around that and, and you know, it, it doesn't match. So, so how did you end up with Bottle after all this? Yes. Oh, man. Um, so that was the first company I left. We started another company um, called Edcoda. It was actually based here in Kansas City. We actually raised quite a bit of money. And what was it called? Edcoda. Okay. Yeah, we built a... Do you, know, do you guys know what an MMORPG is? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we built an educational, like, online role-playing game. And what was that acronym again? MMORPG. So what does that stand for? Massive multiplayer online role-playing game all those games from the esports league they're all okay. those games yeah it's okay. kind of like world of warcraft like all that stuff uh, yeah Fortnite, so we built one of those it was our fault actually we we never went in to validate the market which is one of my biggest uh lessons learned so we thought what we did in colombia which when we did it in colombia it was we were working with the government so they had devices they pre-installed the software into the devices and loaded it into schools so we thought that we could build a super awesome, like full-on 3D card, um, uh, like high graphics online role-playing game and launch it here. It had to be a computer install, which was <laughs> any any educator or any IT director in the education space would be shaking their head right now because they're like, no, there's no way you're going to let anybody install software into your computer, uh, the computers in schools. So that... We ended up folding that company, and uh, and then we started from scratch just working with teachers before we even built any product for Bottle. And by the way, if you're listening, you can check out Bottle. It's B-O-D-D-L-E, BottleLearning.com. I was just there, right here in the studio. It looks yeah. cool, man. The I website the, looks nice. I saw the characters. But I, you know, I think that's important. Like, you talk about, the, you mentioned a couple things. The kids wh- got a whiff of the education. Yep. Like I, I, I mean, I guess I get it, um, but it, I think anything you can do that keeps the, I mean, that Ryan Weber from the Tech Council was in here a while ago, and we were talking. He was talking about where was that school? Was that in Liberty, Liberty, Missouri? Where yeah, I think it kid, was Liberty. Where all the kids were using, they were like a, basically like a paperless 
school. Like everything was on screens and it was super controversial. Like people were all pissed off about it. And then on the other hand, there was like a two, there's like a lottery you have to win to get into the school. Yeah. And you know, that, I don't have a problem with that personally. Like I think screens are, I mean, what are we going to all of a sudden be a screen free society? I mean, maybe if like Armageddon comes, but like I welcome it with my kids, but I just try to moderate like what they're doing. I don't let them sit there on my phone and watch kids play with toys on YouTube all day. Like, but they learn, like my daughter has a very large vocabulary and I feel like a lot of it is because of the interactive nature and the different things. So, and your game looks cool. So, um, so where do you see this? You know, so you just here, you, you just want some money. Yeah. You're going on tour. You can go with Watson and his new tour bus. Yeah. Anytime. His fictional tour bus. We hit the top 100 oh, for business pod, for bot, for uh, podcasts, yes, business podcasts, that. and That's awesome. and with that, Matt went rock star on us. He's demanding a tour bus, a jet. Yeah, I don't. I still don't understand why you need a dressing room and a dressing room with a seahorse in it. Well, you know. Do you guys have a seahorse character? I'm eclectic. We might be able to get this out no. of the way. We might have to build <laughs> one. Um, so. You know, as you're going out, so obviously they're putting you on the road because they, well, they're your, they're investors yeah. in your business, mm-hmm. so they, they're it's that's good though. Yeah. I mean, that's a powerful, that's a powerful ally. It's yes, someone that, is... that if they get behind what you're doing, you get, you know, get, get a nice push behind it. I mean, so, do they would they potentially invest more? Um, I don't know. I don't want to speak on behalf of them. I I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Just curious. I would imagine that that's part of it, though. I mean, yeah. your position. Why wouldn't you? I mean, I it, dude, raising money sucks. You've done it before. Yeah, it's not fun. It's not. It's not what we wake up and go, man. I just love to go so raise who, some money. So who who is all part of your team at this point? So in the U.S. is me and my co-founder Edna. Okay. Uh, she's here in Kansas City as well, and then we actually brought on an intern uh, from Oklahoma. Okay. Yeah, she's she's amazing, by the way. Um, and then we have our CTO in Hong Kong. Okay. And then we have a Matt small... Matt was just there. I was just there yeah. a couple oh, weeks really? ago. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And then we have a small development team in Pakistan. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Are they in Karachi? They're in Lahore. Okay. Yeah. There's, is that, it's funny, like, most people don't realize Karachi, Pakistan's 20 million people. It's huge. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of developers there. Um, so, back to the, to the, to the tour... Um, so what again are you going to do when you're there? Are you there to talk to other business leaders or are you there to get advice about your business or present your business to other people that may use it? Like Um, what's your, like, how are you going to get the, how is the world going to play bottle now? Yeah. So it's going to depend, uh, on which like conference or event we go to. So the one coming up in two weeks, that is, um, an educational technology conference, mostly for teachers and Mm -hmm. like tech directors. So teachers would be present. I'm, I'm actually doing a, a presentation uh, about gamification and how to gamify the classroom mm-hmm. as well. So it's mostly engaging with teachers there. And then, you know, that's where, like, companies, educational companies like, you know, Kaplan, McGraw-Hill, and those guys would be there as well, as well as other educational startups. So that one is called ISTE. It's super, super busy, 18,000 attendees. Wow. Yeah. So how how – Kind of what stage are you with this business now? I mean, so do you have a lot of paying customers? Like, what what is your, how do you scale this thing? Yeah, so currently we have 150 student testers. We're in cl- eight classrooms. We haven't launched our product yet. Okay. Um, which is why this, you know, working with AT&T at this time is perfect because mm-hmm. we're planning to go to market in August. Okay. If all goes well. And um, when users want to jump on, they, I mean, right now is a sign-up process, so we we chat with them on Zoom to make sure that they're a teacher and they're uh, really willing to be engaged. Uh, yeah, I'm on your us. website right now, and it says I could sign up for the pilot. Yeah. So that's mm-hmm. what that is. And yes. Have you had? You said you have to make sure they're a teacher. Had you, was yeah. there an issue where someone wasn't? Yeah, we would have like uh, oh, people weird. who are um, had other like educational technology companies, and you know, I'll, go- I'll LinkedIn them, and oh, it's probably a. a you know, somebody who thought we were doing something really similar to them, they wanted to check our product out. Yeah, but we're backed up. We have a list of 80 people right now that we still have to go through and call. Um, so we know that, you know, people are interested for sure. Have you, so have you validated, like, how you will charge for the product? Like, what you'll... 
what customers yes. will pay, all that sort of stuff. Um, we haven't finalized the price point, but we're probably going to go through like a, a free trial into a district-wide or school-wide license. And um, yeah, for those who are unable to get that, we'll give them um, additional like extra time. Extra Seems like time. we know three or four people that sell stuff to schools now. Okay. Yeah, I mean, or yeah. We do. Well, who else? Rack Performance. True. Roy. Roy. There's somebody healthy else. Healthy hip-hop. Yeah, there's somebody else, too. Yeah. No, who, who, who are we leaving out? I don't know. I think I'm going to think but, of it later. But, but yeah. EdTech is a big business. There's a lot of it in Kansas yeah. City, actually. The, the, uh, and that's one of the things our involvement with Healthy Hip-Hop had really exposed me just through talking to Roy is how big the EdTech industry is. I don't have numbers right off hand, but it's big. Yeah. No, oh, eSports big. League is another one. There you go. There's another one. Yeah. And, you know, the, but, four. but it was huge. Like, I was shocked. I mean, literally, like, my eyes, I was like, what? Well, there's also a lot of learning companies in Kansas City that aren't necessarily um, th- th- the same as yours. Think about, like, Laurel Holtz Company. They do yeah. online training. you got True. SM Learning. You've got other other companies that are kind of in educational-related stuff in town. There's a lot of a lot of that stuff. Yeah, and that's, actually. I mean, that's, I think that was probably a natural progression. I don't know how we're going to do all that technology stuff and tell our kids they can't look at a screen, though. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. So what are some of the challenges? The, what, give us a story of heartache. Oh, man, heartache. And then, and then rise up at the end and, and win. I don't know. I mean, just something like give, get, there's a lot of people that, you know, like I said, the, ed, the ed tech, it, there's a lot of people that are passionate about teaching and learning. There's a lot of people that want to do what you're doing. Yep. Um, by the way, thank you for sharing the the story of, you know, like, I mean, think about that. You develop 90 products on the way yeah. to bottle. But, that, I mean, that's that's the way it goes sometimes. I mean, I tell people I'll try 10 things hoping that one works. And yeah. that's just sometimes the way it goes. And I don't think entrepreneurs give enough, uh, I don't think they think about that. I mean, you've been the same way, right, Matt? Yeah. Actually, everything Matt touches just turns to gold. No, that's not true at all. It, it, no, but it's it's not, and it's so what you know. Other than you know, going obviously, how do you bounce back from that? Like at some point, you ha- you wanted to quit. Man, I want to quit like almost every other week. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Normal. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like, why am I doing this? Like, I can you know get a full time job somewhere and and just relax. But then at the end of the day, you know, you just realize, you know, what what do you define as happy, right? Where do you find happiness? Is you know getting a full time job, going to Miami to retire, is that really real happiness to you? And I think you know finding that for most people, at least for myself, the core drive of you know what really drives me is when you're able to build something, and there's a lot of satisfaction in that. So even though I'm down in the dumps, even though it's hard, it's like this is going to be worth it. Um, I own it, um, and if I fail, it's all my fault. So at least for now, every single failure that I see, I see it as like, hey, you know what? That's a really good way um, not to do it, or that's a really good lessons learned, and that's the only way to rise up from it. Um, and it might be difficult, as, especially for my demographic, because you know, Asian culture growing up, failure is so um, they, you know, it's so menacing. You know, you don't. Well, we run into that in our office in Cebu. I mean, occasionally, you know, and that's that's. That's real. Would you agree? Yeah, employees that have performance problems or whatever, they take it really. And if you address it with them, yeah, it's really like a different way about yeah. doing it. If you don't go the right way, then the next day they show up and quit. You know, or, or, or I mean, not necessarily every time, but it, yeah, I, that's definitely real. So yeah. we were mentioning earlier you, you were at our live recording. Yeah. And that was about startup burnout. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you want to quit every other week occasionally, which by the way is normal, like I think the last. 15 years of my life have gone like that Heaven years i mean there's definitely days where it's tough i mean yeah. it's absolutely it never it doesn't get easier and i think you already kind of fit the dna and and you know you're a young guy but you've been doing this for a while now where i think you're already in that path of like you're never going to work for somebody else like it's just never going to happen yeah it's going to be it's hard. not going to happen but we always tell people well, it was actually Laurel that may have first brought it up I, i'm an unpl- i'm unemployable me too there's no way i mean you know, i just i couldn't work for anybody else like i don't even know what i do you know i just have to start something different i mean but you know it's so do you think that some of that those ups and downs obviously you know as being an entrepreneur especially like doing software and stuff like that you know it's like we always mention the ups and the downs 
Um, do you think that those, those are burnout? Like, how, do you have any tips on how to avoid that? Like right now I'm on like three hours of sleep and I'm really freaking tired. Right. But I got stuff to do and I don't think I'd even sleep if I went to go lay down because it's on my mind. Yeah. Your mind just gets running and running. Oh man. Uh, that's hard. I, I think the most important thing is sleep though, which is kind of like what we always draw from. And that's kind of like where I'm able to bounce back when I actually get like one, just one good night's rest. Right. I'm like, wow, I actually feel different. And then the very next day, even though I've personally experienced the 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 benefits from it, I'm like, you know what? I need to finish this. Let me draw from sleep. And then that's kind of like where it starts. Well, that's my point though. Yeah. It's like if it if it's especially if it's problematic, mm-hmm. and that'll just keep me up. I'm just gonna lay in bed and stare at the ceiling. So I might as well get up. And, I learned that a while a long time ago. I might as well just get up and try to figure out whatever it is that's bothering me. Yeah. I just go fix it because then I'll actually have, maybe I'll get to sleep after that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it really like realistically is a problem for me. Like, I mean, I've had issues and, and it's not uncommon for our employees, people I know, they ask me all the time. They're like, do you sleep? It's because I hit them back on the, I ping them back on whatever we're talking on it. Like just any hour of the day. 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m., all day. And I'm like, do you sleep? There was a rumor going around that I was a chat bot. I'm not kidding. <laughs> well, you threatened to make a map bot. That wasn't a threat. That's no. a reality. All right. Yeah. Yeah, but here's the other thing, though. One thing I, I have noticed, in, you know, how do you, how do you bounce back from it? A lot of times, you know, when I'm tired or just in general, as a business owner, you, would, you guys, I'm sure you understand, there's a lot of worry. And a, a lot of times when you worry so much, you just feel like the need to do something about it right now and i think well know, that's and that's why i said but yeah. you know also though i i've had some of my i there's something about being really tired for me that i actually have some of my most creative insightful and productive things like in the in the book that's coming out next month i wrote twelve thousand words in one day on that wow and i was dude and that's i'd been crazy. up the night before i but for whatever reason it just started pouring out of me and that's one of the things for me and that's where it's and I, I actually think it's important. I think one of the, the big upsides and benefits of being an entrepreneur and working for yourself is, well, you get to do it on your own time. And I haven't had a, quote, real job. And even when I had a real job, I worked from home for a company that was in California. So I still had my own schedule, and I've gotten used to that. But I've learned if, you, if, you get, if you're rolling with something, keep going with it, especially when it comes to, like, creativity. So, like, with the writing thing, and, dude, you've, you've written a lot of stuff. Yeah. 12,000 words is a lot. That's a lot of words. And, and it was good. I gave it to my words. editor, and he was like, dude, you did this in a day? And he actually asked me if I found the perfect mix of Adderall and coffee. And I said, <laughs> I said maybe, but my point was is, is it, you write it until you don't, until it won't go anymore. And if you get whatever. in the groove sometimes, you just got to keep going. Yeah, and that's the thing is, and, but because but, you don't know when you're going to get that back. But I, I also think that, Sometimes the best thing you can do is step away from stuff, though, and yeah. clear your head. And I actually, last weekend, I spent some time with my dad. I was helping him paint. And uh, I told him, I'm like, I was like, in some sense, this is like really therapeutic and a stress reliever just to like mindlessly mm-hmm. paint, you know, and not think about anything else. Dude, that's another thing that you talk like, uh, all right, I, I told you I started mowing my lawn again this year because I wasn't for a while, but I have whatever, for whatever reason, I have a lot of good ideas when I'm mowing my lawn. And I think it's because it's that mindlessness. Yeah. You like you're just doing enough of something else to like maybe clear the noise. Yeah. My ADD is bad, so any anything that slows, whatever the fuck's going on in my head. Well, now, I think I'm the example of, of painting required so much attention that I couldn't even think about something else. Like you know, did such detailed work that I had to really hundred percent focus. Were on you, what I was you were doing, doing it was that detail. Were you doing like a Mona Lisa? Well, or? I mean, I was, I mean, I was freehand <laughs> painting stuff with a brush and whatever. So. It, like paint by numbers no so if you ask me if i'd rather paint or get beat with a stick i want to at least see the stick i hate painting really yeah man i just enjoyed it like just painting a wall like is that what you're doing just or whatever but uh this is like all wood trim work okay but man this is getting more i didn't realize you were such a craftsman i'm a master i drove my truck today would you like to to borrow my tools you never know what could happen no i have plenty of my own tools okay do you yeah oh okay so, uh, well, as a game creator, you probably run it. Well, games are addictive. 
Yes, I mean, obviously, like different. you start playing. Next thing you know, it's like three days later. You're like, what? Yeah. Is that when you when you're a game builder? Is it the same way with building them? I would imagine you get sucked in. Um, not for designing games, because you know, at least for me, I know if I I design something wrong, that's a lot of payroll that's going to <laughs> <laughs> that's going to the dumps. You know, so you really want to think about it. And sometimes, you know, just the need to get it perfect is just frustrating. Uh, but yeah, games are super addictive and and yeah they're, they're designed that way it's kind of like sad sometimes but but they're also extremely fun at the same time if well what's something uh, obviously a game builder is as all right so in a lot of the places that we've traveled to whether it's been belarus or the philippines or wherever there's always companies that are game companies like when i was in men's uh, war games mm-hmm. they got like two thousand people working mm-hmm. they got a huge operation there so if you want to be a game builder what's a good approach to getting started with that do you just start by building your own game or i mean wh- how do you go how do you do that yeah so um I always advocate, like this is what I'm going to be talking about when I go to school conferences. There's a book called um, Actionable Gamification. So it teaches you about the core drives that actually drive users so you can design a game around it. Because what I would see in a lot of like colleges or you know people who want to be game designers, they're, they always say the same thing. Oh, I play Zelda or this game and I like it and I want to build a game just like it. But then they don't understand what makes the game so fun so that when they try to do it, they make a you know, not as good version that is not fun at all, and all the money is down the drain. So, you know, understanding how, why, why is this fun? You know, is there ways for you to make it more fun? What is fl- flawed in the game? That's a, that's an awesome book. It teaches you about the eight core drives that humans have. Well, and the, the problem with so many games is they're like. What was that called again? Actionable gamification. Games are so trendy, and people get bored with them very, very fast. But I think the good thing about what you're doing is, you know, you're making grades for or you're making games for, you know, second graders or third graders or whatever, and it's like every year you got a new class that goes through and yep. learns this material, and so that material will live on for a long time. Yep. So. Matt, I have great news. Really? You have earned eight points for being on today's podcast. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, 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 and if you come do another one, you might get eight points more. So that means I got Is six. this actionable gamification? Not really, because Matt would be like, "Why? what does the eight points do? Why don't do tell him that, man. I already <laughs> have 16 points today then, so what do I get? You, you don't have enough points to get anything. You have enough points to, well, you don't have any points now. Is this like Chuck E. Cheese, like I have yeah. 16 coupons? Yeah, so you got a pencil. Oh. Hey, yeah. At least for Chuck E. Cheese, you can redeem it for toys and stuff, right? I want so. a bounty ball. You've got it. Steal He's the egg. He's got the egg. Can yeah, I have the, the egg? The All right, egg. there we go. Hang on. Let's let's get a picture. We'll post it on our Instagram. By the way, if you want to follow Bottle on Instagram, you have bot. That's Bottle Learning. B O D D L E Learning. And we're following you now. We're trying to be like super exclusive with our following. So oh, you're thank like you. One of twenty-eight people now. But yeah, and I'll post the. I'll post. Watson's winnings. You cashed in your 16 points. All right. Does that did that make you want to come back and do another Absolutely. podcast? Absolutely. I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> I'm coming back. By the way, what and we're almost out of time, but what mm-hmm. were what are some of those core drivers? I don't expect you to know all eight of them, but yep. I was trying to hit one of them. I figured if I could gamify the podcast, then I can get you in here all the time. So points, it's a part of possession. Having possessions is one. One that you would see that is super strong in like – Horribly, well, depending on what is well designed, uh, mobile games or in casinos is the unpredictability and randomness of things. So, for example, you know, if if I'm like, hey, for ten bucks you can get a burger, or you can say ten bucks you can s- spin a wheel and get a thousand bucks. The 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 randomness is and unpredictability is actually, you know, it makes people addicted. Okay. So if you look so at that's why slot machines and yes. all that. Okay. So if you look, if you see mobile games like the ones that are doing really well financially, they usually have things called like loot crates, where you know you buy points with real money, and then you roll a dice, and then you, yeah, you, you see like what prizes you get is all random, and you know users just keep pumping money in, um, and they call them cash whales for 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 these games. 
Hmm. I mean, there's games that are slot machine games that you don't win anything. You win virtual coins, but it takes real dollars to win virtual coins. Yeah. I'm pretty sure when we went to Vegas together, that's what we were playing. Then we didn't even realize it because I definitely <laughs> didn't get any money back <laughs> out of that there machine. There are there are games like that. I can't do, believe people. Do play you them. know that Clarence is friends with Joel Johnson, the creator of Mixtape? So if we don't play Mixtape, I think okay. Joel's, Joel would be upset. But we you drew your it. card, dude. They were. <sighs> You drew no, a scenario card. No, no. You drew... It was interpretive dance. Yeah, no, exactly. No and way. I want you to do one. No. Why not? Uh, these other cards are ones we've already done. I know, but you then you drew card. interpretive dance. I think you should no. do an interpretive dance. All right, so here, we'll find one. Why can't you do why can't you do a scenario? Lip syncing? Everyone loves lip sync on podcasts. Right? Isn't do, that a natural? Do, 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 oh God, if you do baby do, shark do, again. Do, 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 do. All right, here we go. Mixtapethegame.com, digital version coming soon. All right, the song you would play during your electric performance at the Breakdancing World Championship. This is it. Is this my interpretive dance? I'm going to win, man. I'm going with Electric Boogaloo. And you don't even know that song, do you? No. Okay. Breakdancing, huh? Yeah. Do you even know what that is? No. You don't know what breakdancing <laughs> no. is? I'm going to go with the electric slide. Okay. I'm going to go with Sex Gant, and I know it by LMFAO. Okay, he won. Yeah, winner. All right. Woohoo! Man. All right, how many points do I get for that? Uh, uh, 16. And no! You get to 15. You get to read. No, you don't get to win. You didn't win. <laughs> no, he anything. gets 15. Why would he get 15, but you got 16? You didn't even do anything. You spent your points, dude. You spent your points. You can have the egg on, back. Yeah, right, there, you go, there, there you go. There you go. All right, it's totally <laughs> worth it. I'll be back. And you can have these mixtape cards. No, then I'm. You don't give away my mixtape <laughs> cards. I need those back, man. I, God, this is just falling to pieces. I, th- this is what happens when action mold gamification goes wrong. Yeah. I mean, and let that be a lesson to all you guys. And that is also. See, dude, the map bot wouldn't have done that. The map bot wouldn't have done that. And the map bot wouldn't. The map bot would have been happy to have 16 points. And it probably would have saved him for something better than a green squishy egg. True. Actually, it probably would have bought the green squishy egg like 90 times in a row and then, and taught, it it, and then, no, and then taught itself that that wasn't a good gift or prize. So, well, anyway, um, if you get a chance, B-O-D-D-L-E, bottlelearning.com. Followed you on Instagram, also bottle, bottle learning. Um, I'm looking forward to, I w- I'd like to have you back so you can tell us like yeah. down the road, like I want to hear about how the tour went. Yeah, um, for sure. And, for sure. and how that went and. Who knows? Maybe you could even call in from one of those where we keep threatening to move to the world of call-ins. Yeah. Like we even planned Matt was going to call from Hong Kong and Cebu. It didn't happen. It sure did. And we told everyone you were going to, too. And then, yeah. Well, I'll be back in Cebu in four weeks. Yeah. Where where we also, at which point we will also forget to call. So. Anyway, well, thank you for coming by. I'm going to go me. check out Bottle Learning. I'm going to go play some games and probably win 17 points. See you next right. time. <laughs>